Fruitwood is a bustling market harbour, filled with fishermen's cottages, Edwardian charisma and cobblestones. Unfortunately, there's a small but noisy contingent out to spoil it, easily recognised by the swallow tattoos across their backs that look as though their thongs have snapped. Most have Jeremy Kyle on their CVs. But we're doing the town an injustice. Let's have some history instead. Back in the 13th century, the peninsula was owned by Jewelacres Abbey. This included the mount known back then as Top Hill because of the frustrated sheep that the monks kept there. A document from 1228 ordered the Sheriff of Lancaster not to interfere with said sheep. Exactly what he'd been doing with them, we can only speculate. Spool forward to Victorian times when the mount was designated the hub around which the pompously named Decimus Burton designed the current port. The entrance lodge was Decimus Burton's office. The locals were rightly proud of their sand hill. In the 1840s, Peter Hesketh built a cobbled wall around it to keep the locals out. A riot ensued. The wall was kicked down and the angry mob forced Peter Hesketh to rethink his plans. Burton's original pavilion looked very different than the present building. It resembled a Chinese pagoda and was named Temple View for reasons best left to those who name buildings. In 1902, it was replaced with the present structure. Fleetwood had a pier once. It wasn't much of a pier, if we're being honest. We watched it burn on September morning back in 2008. The BBC news presenters had to ask locals to send in footage because they didn't have any correspondence close enough. That's Fleetwood for you, out of sight and out of public consciousness. On this corner of the promenade in years gone by, you'd find Professor Aubrey Gray. We'd watch him for hours when there was nothing else to do. Whether his professorial qualifications would have stood up to scrutiny is another matter. But for a small sum, the master astrologer would shout Ishmullah Kushtibob and hand over a small envelope containing secret numbers to those hoping for a win on the pools. Why he'd never taken advantage of his awesome powers himself, we couldn't say. There are three lighthouses in Fleetwood, or at least there were. The trick was to line them up one above the other like a set of traffic lights so that you could safely navigate the channel. Both Lower Light and its taller companion, Pharos, named after the Pharos Lighthouse of Alexandra incidentally and not the Pharaohs as some people think, were opened on December the 1st 1840. They were both originally lit by gas. Wirelight, now lost beneath the waves, suffered several collisions during its lifetime. The worst was in 1870, when a schooner unwittingly carried half of it back to the dock. On May the 16th, 1948, it burned down more or less completely. A certain Sea Cadet leader, who will remain nameless, had been conducting a flare training exercise at the time. Needless to say, it went disastrously wrong. Fleetwood Museum used to be the old custom house. It was also the town hall once. Nowadays it stores Fleetwood's history, the rise and fall of the trawling industry and the rise and fall of the town's founding father, Sir Peter Hesketh. He underestimated the cost of his railway and ended up bankrupt. The Cod Wars put an end to Fleetwood's fishing industry, or rather Maggie did. She hung the trawler men out to dry when Iceland illegally expanded its exclusion zone to 200 miles. One tidbit of history that few people know involves a Fleetwood trawler called the Corella. In 1952, secret biological weapons tests were conducted off Lewis. The Corella sailed into the danger zone, just as the bubonic plague was being released. Two ships were ordered to follow her and intercept any distress calls. Unfortunately, they lost track of her on the way back to Fleetwood. As far as we're aware, however, the plague failed to establish itself. 
Although, judging by the state of some of the druggies around Fleetwood, we're not taking any bets on that. We're forgetting the ghost. Not that there's much to forget. The wraith of an old man allegedly haunts the tram shelter by Pharos Lighthouse. He's been seen there late at night, although he doesn't do much by all accounts. He just wanders off towards the North Euston Gardens, where he mysteriously disappears. Perhaps if the witnesses had hung around, they might have heard his drunken obscenities from the flower bed. And we mustn't forget the Roman columns holding up the portico of the North Euston either. Apparently, they were leftovers from the Black Bull in Ribchester. See, Fleetwood does have some ancient history. It was called Quaggy Meals once. That's Viking for Marketplace. Then there's Bold Street, known colloquially as Blow Street back in the day because of the amount of drug users that used to live along it. It'll probably come as a bit of a shock then to learn that Wilfred Owen, the famous war poet, lived at number 111. At the end of Bowl Street, next to the North Euston Hotel, stands the building where one and a half centuries ago fishermen's friends began. Pharmacist James Lofthouse first manufactured the famous throat lozenges back in 1865 to relieve respiratory problems suffered by Fleetwood trawlermen. Perhaps we ought to give the trams a hearing before we leave them behind. Fleetwood is the only town in Britain that has a tram line running the full length of its main street. Admittedly, it's not a particularly long street, but it's the thought that counts. The tramway dates from 1885, one of the oldest electric tramways in the world. In celebration of this, Every year, Fleetwood holds Tram Sunday, where Tramaracks, sorry, uh, Tram Enthusiasts, in bobble hats and spot cream, mingle freely with families in search of a free day out. And there's the Marine Hall, opened in 1935. They've spent some money improving the grounds in recent years. Now the clog dancers have somewhere to perform without the crunch of empty cider bottles underfoot. As you might expect, the Marine Hall has its own <laughs> resident ghost. His name is Bill. He was the caretaker. He died on the job, apparently. Now he wanders the building every night, oblivious to such obstructions as walls, ensuring that everybody leaves in good order. Presumably, he has a blind spot when it comes to the drugs and the colonnade. There's loads more we could tell you, but we're not going to. Instead, click like, subscribe, give us a share, whatever. And all being well, we'll be back same time, same place, next week.